Coming up on Tech News Today, Nokia's Lumia 1020. Is it just for photographers? Microsoft's reorg is slashing departments left and right. And can the Moto X minimize bloatware and compete Samsung and be a big hit? All that more next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Thursday, July 11th, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by ProXPN. ProXPN is a virtual private network that allows you to use the internet the way it should be, anonymously and without oversight. For 20% off your new account, go to proxpn.com slash twit and use the code TNT. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used Samsung Galaxy iPhone and other smartphones are worth at gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zakta. And I'm Jason Howell. We are continuing the slow march of a merit-free week, uh, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Tom Merritt, not without... Uh, Correct. We have merits, yes. just not Tom Merritt specifically. But this is the show where we keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world, starting each time with the top 10 stories of the day in the news views. <laughs> Microsoft has announced that major reorg we expected. CEO Steve Ballmer sent a strategy document and email to employees. There's a lot of information, but he assured all there's no change in leadership at the tippy top. The new Microsoft gets rid of the current five Microsoft business units, Windows, Server and Tools, Business Division, Entertainment and Devices, Online Services, each with its own president and CFO. All three of Microsoft's operating systems will be now be lumped together in a single division. Marketing and business strategy for all of Microsoft's product lines is moving out of individual business units and into a centralized cross-company group. Nokia unveiled the Nokia Lumia 1020. True to the rumors, the Windows phone has a 41 megapixel pure view camera built in. Nokia says the 1020 has the largest backside illuminated sensor available on a smartphone. The device will cost a whopping $300 when it launches on AT&T on July 26th. As Motorola Mobility readies itself to release the first flagship smartphone, dubbed the Moto X, since being acquired by Google last year, we're learning more and more about the device's design and also that Google's expected to allow its Motorola hardware unit to spend up to $500 million to market the highly anticipated device in the U.S., and some overseas markets, including Europe, said people familiar with the matter. In a blog post penned by Jeff Moss, otherwise known as the Dark Tangent, DEF CON is not inviting the U.S. government to participate in DEF CON. The post cites the recent revelations of massive government surveillance and says, quote, it would be best for everyone involved if the feds call a time out. <laughs> DEF CON will run from August 1st to the 4th at the Rio in Las Vegas. If this, then that, also known as IFTTT, also known as IFT has launched an iPhone app with a new set of channels specific to Apple's platform to build and use its automated actions. Ift is a utility that you can use to hook multiple web services together to perform automated actions for you. For example, I have all of my Instagram photos automatically backed up to Dropbox. In the new app, you pick a channel. It's hooked into a data feed or API from an app or service like Evernote or Pocket, and then that channel is combined with a trigger to create an automated action. According to new data from Gartner, worldwide personal computer shipments totaled 76 million units in the second quarter. That's down 11% compared to last year at the same time. This marks the fifth quarter in a row where PC shipments are down. IDC also backs up Gartner's data, but says the decline was actually 11.4%. Take that. HP has stated there are backdoors in its store of virtual products and says it will patch the problems by the 17th of this month. HP says the vulnerability, quote, could be remotely exploited to gain unauthorized access to the device. The issue appears to have exist, existed since 2009. Yesterday, a district court found Apple conspired to raise ebook prices. Apple was fighting the DOJ while five publishers already agreed to pay a total of $166 million to settle. If Apple owes damages, Apple's payment could be severe because the antitrust case is under the Clayton Act, which automatically triples antitrust awards. However, Apple will appeal, so this case is not over just yet. 
They're good at that. We'll peel. Drawing out cases. European ISPs are under investigation by the European Commission over antitrust concerns. The EC conducted a series of raids because the commission has concerns that the company concerned may have violated EU antitrust rules that prohibit the abuse of a dominant market position. The EC did not name the ISPs, but Reuters says the investigation involves companies like Telefonica and Orange. You Send It has a new name, and it's now known as Hightail. You Send It was the file sharing service lots of people used when they wanted to attach something super large to an email. Now, the CEO of the newly named company, Brad Garlinghouse, told All Things D that the name constrained our product breadth. Hightail will expand to a broader file sharing and collaboration service. Now, the, co the company is going to offer a subscription plan. 16 bucks per month gets you unlimited file storage. That sounds pretty cool. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by ProXPN, folks that want your online freedom and privacy to be intact. You know, governments and ISPs, we talk about them on the show all the time. They want to control what you're doing. They want to look at what you're what you're browsing. They they want to spy on you. If you're at you're at a coffee house and you've got free Wi-Fi, you're at an airport, that's not really very safe at all. ProXPN is a global VPN, virtual private network, that works with almost any internet connection to give you a secure encrypted tunnel through which all your online data passes back and forth. Any online app can work with ProXPN, like your web browser, browser, email, file sharing, IM programs. ProXPN keeps everything you do hidden from those prying eyes. It'll keep your physical location hidden and gives you access to any website or online service, no matter where you live or no matter where you're traveling. You can bypass internet filtering and blocked websites. You can protect yourself against ISP six strikes rules. ProXPN software is for Windows and Mac, and it offers lots of advanced controls, allowing you to select the programs and the ports that you want to anonymously route through ProXPN servers. ProXPN also works with your iOS or your Android device. You can use your data plan or public corporate Wi-Fi with complete and total privacy on the go. You don't even have to use an app. World-class cust customer support as well. And our very own Security Now expert, Steve Gibson, gives it a thumbs up and that's a glowing review because that's what he does for a living. Go to proxpn.com slash twit right now for more information and to sign up. Premium accounts are usually about 10 bucks a month or $74.95 for a year, but we have a special offer. Use the code TNT and you'll receive 20% off the lifetime of your account. That comes out to less than $5 a month on that yearly plan. And if you're not satisfied, you can cancel within seven days for a full refund. We think you'll be happy. ProXPN.com slash twit and sign up with that code TNT today. And thanks to ProXPN for their support of Tech News Today. Joining us now to talk about the stories of the day, the big ones anyway, is our very own Shannon Morse of Hi. BYB and Hack5 and ThreatWire and all sorts of good stuff <laughs> online. Thank you. Happy to be here. Good to have you. Always good to have you. And we have everybody in studio, which doesn't That's happen crazy. that often. It never happens. You audio listeners are like, who cares? Sounds the same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's start off with this whole Microsoft company reorg. It's 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 complicated. It's official though. It's complicated. And there's a really long post at Microsoft. The title is One Microsoft Company Realigns to Enable Innovation at Greater Speed if Efficiency. And it's apparently a text of an internal email sent out by Steve Ballmer. Now there, the five business units, like Sarah mentioned, are gone. Each one has its own president and CFO. That's that's done. Microsoft says it's organizing the company by function. I know that's crazy. All three of Microsoft's operating systems, one division. Marketing a business, one division. Uh, these changes are going to be phased in in the next couple of months. Now, in the in the personnel shakeup, Terry Meyerson, who was the head of Windows Phone, is now the head of Operating Systems Engineering Group. So that means Windows, Windows Phone, and everything with operating systems. Julie Larson Green, who is the current head of Windows and Surface, is now the head of Devices and Studios Engineering Group. Really, that's a mouthful. Devices and Studios Engineering Group. Runs engineering for Xbox, Surface, Games, and Entertainment. Uh, the president of the Microsoft Business Division is leaving the company. And current chief of marketing, Tammy Reller, will head a new cross-company marketing group. 
And Microsoft saying it's making these changes to enable to, quote, innovate with greater speed, efficiency, and capability in a fast-changing world, end quote. Mm -hmm. And Microsoft's stated strategy is this. It's from the email. Going forward, our strategy will focus on creating a family of devices and services for individuals and businesses that empower people around the globe at home, at work, and on the go for the activities they value most. Do you think these massive changes, this new organization – is going to see Microsoft be able to be nimble, or they're always going to be this lumbering dinosaur giant thing? Well, given all their issues that they've had in the past year with Windows 8 and the new updates to the Microsoft Xbox 360, uh, or the new Xbox. Xbox One. Yeah, Xbox One. I, I, I'm a little bit nervous for them. I feel like all this shakeup is going to spur a whole bunch of issues within the company. Um, with that said, though, one thing that they mentioned in this strategy uh, story that he sent out is that they're rallying behind a single strategy as one company, not a collection of divisional strategies. Now, from my experience in management, when you put too many people into one bucket and you ask everybody to have some kind of input into one specific thing, it gets really, really emotional and there's a whole bunch of controversy going on. And I'm worried that having too many people poking their fingers into one thing is going to kind of screw them up. Yeah, you get these situations where if someone's like, well, wait a second, I was in this whole other division and now I'm working for this person who was, eh, sure, I mean, yeah, okay, let's use Terry Meyerson as an example. It's like, current head of Windows Phone is now the operating systems for everybody boss. Well, that's probably a good idea. Long term for Microsoft, it's probably good for Microsoft, Microsoft to say, which way is tech heading in? Mobile division is bigger than ever. We want our products to have more synergy than they have in the past. Certainly with, you know, something like Windows RT and Windows 8, that's a great example of like, you know, those two situations should have been a lot closer and that probably has a lot to do with management and too many different divisions that weren't talking to each other. However, you do get a lot of pushback from people saying, well, what do you know? Yeah. I mean, you were, you were working on Windows Phone. That's totally different than Windows 8 for the desktop. I'm sure that's the that's going to be the initial uh, response from people. And there's no layoffs expected, but I imagine people who behave like that are going to get knocked out of this. Because yeah. Microsoft really wants to make sure that their operating systems work the same from the phone to RT to 8. And the weird fact that RT runs on ARM and so does phone, it makes no sense why there's two of them. There has to be some kind of merger there. If the UIs operate the same, that's been the big thing it's like we're gonna have one experience at the build conference one experience throughout that's huge for their operating systems then the learning curve changes if you know your phone you know your op you know your desktop or tablet that could be big julie larson green moving from windows over to devices she knows software very well she's going to know hey wait a second our hardware should work really well with our software if we allow these components to exist so i'm really excited about what's going to happen there i have no idea if they will have like a horrible growing pains in the next couple of months because they are phasing it in. I'm sure they're going to run into a lot of pushback. Mm -hmm. But it could be interesting to see Microsoft move into a faster paced. The one Microsoft concept reminds me of one Sony, right? That's what they called it. One Sony, we're going to flatten this because everyone was fighting each other all the time. If this stops fighting, maybe they can do this faster, leaner company. You know, I wonder if Larson Green, being now in charge of, of of not just software, but engineering for the Xbox and the Surface. I mean, the Surface, the Surface didn't didn't do as well as Microsoft hoped. The Xbox still has great brand recognition. Uh, people are 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 continually excited about the future of that. If the Surface could somehow be rebranded as some sort of a mobile Xbox that does other things. Say the Xbox isn't just for gaming anymore. I'm kind of just thinking crazy right now, but that that could be something that we see. You know, let's let's figure out what our strong brands are and and figure out how to how to push what we do well into products that haven't actually gone over that well with the public. So it could be the Xbox One and the Xbox Two. <laughs> Here's your second piece. The Xbox Go. <laughs> Just walk away with it. It's mobile. <laughs> All right, let's move on to another announcement. Uh, Nokia, we kind of knew this going into the announcement this morning uh, that Nokia put together because uh, there was a YouTube channel and and and, and some stuff got leaked um, uh, onto the web. But the Lumia 1020, which is the successor to the 920, has 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 some very interesting specs. So let's go through some of them now. A 41 megapixel camera. That's it? 41 megapixels? It, we almost we could almost just stop right there and be like, that's it. That's the specs. There are other specs, too. Uh, Nokia's adding two gigabytes of RAM. One gigabyte was in the 920. Um, a 4.5-inch AMOLED display like the Lumia 925. 
some improvements to the microphone, uh, but the device is still running a 1.5 gigahertz dual core S4 processor, same as the 920 uh, and the 925. Now you had mentioned, I as in the news views, a whopping $300 on a two year contract exclusively with AT&T. So, you know, only some of us are even going to have a chance to to, to, to buy it, even if we think that that's high. Pre-orders start on uh, July 16th. The full launch is on July 26th. It'll come in matte black, white, or yellow. A very bright yellow, in fact. And boy, does it look like a camera. Uh, in fact, it, that's exactly what it looks like. A nice, <laughs> small little camera that does a lot of other stuff. Shannon, 41 megapixels. That's insanity. Of course, that's not factoring in a very small sensor and this and that, so it's not exactly the same as some... Uh, large, uh, extremely fancy digital SLR with a 41 megapixel camera, but still impressive. Does $300 sound like a lot to you? Yeah. I mean, it's still a Windows phone, right? So that's yes. the big problem here is it's still a Windows phone. Who's going to end up on AT&T spending $300 getting into a two-year contract and still buying a Windows phone when the really only big thing about this is that it's it's basically a camera. They're selling it to photographers, not so much people that want, you know, a heavy-duty, hardcore, you know, Android phone like, you know, me and maybe I as do. Well, 300 bucks, and then you start, if you're really interested in the camera, you might start looking at point and shoot, to start looking at DSLRs or yeah. the low cost mirrorless ones. So then you start creeping up into like, oh, I can pay $400 for a real camera. You start wondering what's the real appeal to this when it comes to having a standout product. I don't know if this is going to like sell off the shelves like crazy, but I'm imagining this is like a flagship. This is what we can do right now. It's going to cost a lot of money right now. The next generation is going to be the $199, the $99 thing. Because Nokia is really trying to say, look, if you want to be able to take low light pictures and have optical image stabilization in your phone and you're tired of the really herky-jerky stuff of mobile video, that could be something they can uh, leverage over terms of years. This, I think, is just a flagship. This is what we can do now. And it's actually quite thin considering the original peer view looked like a camera. It was a big, fat, monstrous-looking thing uh, well, compared to this. Uh, at and I don't know if that's the best launch partner to go with. I think Verizon would have been stronger. But uh, this is, it's, it's a start, I think. Well, it's another start. They're constantly starting. Yeah. I mean, I try to think of, yeah, I try to think of this as, okay, for super phone enthusiasts, or pardon me, super camera enthusiasts, it's like, this looks very nice. However, for, for anybody who's like, listen, I want to have a really fancy camera or certainly something that's capable of taking great pictures with me at all times, so it might as well be part of my phone, to go with Windows Phone is an interesting choice because there are just so many fewer apps that utilize kind of the social and online elements of how picture taking has morphed these days. So yeah, you might be a photographer who's like, I, I'm just gonna shoot pictures and I'm never gonna share with anybody and it doesn't really matter if there's an awesome Flickr app for Windows Phone in order to upload my photos. But I think more and more these days for a lot of people that does matter because that's how photography has evolved as well. Yeah, but Windows Phone has something that the other operating systems don't. They have something called lenses. So instead of you having to go to Instagram, you have to go to this app, that app, and that activates the camera app, you activate the camera app, and then you can use a different lens, which could be Instagram, could be a different uh, application that's built in. So the fact that this is a camera and you have this easier way, instead of going, which app do I want to use? Do I want to use Vine? Do I want to use this or that? You use the lenses that are built in, and there's a number of those growing. So I think that might be interesting if Nokia is making a bunch of those. I think they already did with their last version of Lumia. So it, it could be be if they have the right software to go with it if you're going to say this is a great camera they have manual controls in the camera the video taking looks pretty impressive 720p and you can do 6x zoom on this and this is not a digital zoom i believe so uh, 1080p actually 1080p 30 frames but i don't think you can do a zoom at that point oh i see what you're saying so yeah, yeah, yeah. if you want to yeah, be able to zoom, zoom in up to six times i believe it's not a digital so that's a huge difference you don't have this really crappy pixelation so mm -hmm. i i don't know I kind of want to use this for podcasting. I don't know if I want to see this for like, I don't think a lot of people are going to use it, but I'm just like, this has potential as a nerd for me. Sure. <laughs> it's certainly, you know, setting industry standards quite high uh, for, for the future of cameras. All sorts of good, all sorts of good camera news uh, this week on TNT. All right, let's move on to uh, some more interesting news. It's also a, a big week for announcements. Uh, T-Mobile has announced an interesting upgrade program. Yeah, their boldest moves thing was yesterday, their event, not the thing, uh, the company announced its jump service. Now, for 10 bucks a month, customers can trade in their old phone as frequently as twice a year. And when you get that phone, you're getting it as if you're a new customer. So you don't have to pay outright each time. 
Uh, Jump also includes an insurance element. It's got protection against device theft, mal uh, malfunction, damage, or loss. So a lot of other companies, I think Sprint charges $11 for insurance only, and you don't have this upgrade uh, option. T-Mobile also announced it's got the Sony Xperia Z as an exclusive, the Nokia Lumia 925, and that its LTE service is now live in 116 metropolitan area. And they claim they're on target to get LTE nationwide by the end of the year. They also said no more credit checks. And CEO John Laguerre was pretty much John Laguerre. He's really turning into like a, a cartoon character. He was, he was cussing a lot. A lot of swearing there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but like, we, can, okay. can we get that, uh, that little, what's going on with the uncarrier, Jason? My final comment to you is this is going to continue. This is uncarrier phase two. What I want you to know, and, and this should, you know, drive a bit of fear into the industry. We already know uncarrier phase three, and we know when it's coming. And it's not that far away, so I'll leave you with this uh, little teaser as to what's going on and what's coming. And that was the least awesome uh, controversial. That's the least controversial thing that I think he said during it. He made fun of uh, AT and T, made fun of Verizon. Lots of swearing, as Sarah mentioned. And that video is from The Verge. They t they cut it together a bit. Do you think the other carriers are actually going to change things because they're claiming, oh, they're going to strike fear in the hearts of other carriers, or is just just the act of an upstart? Because T Mobile's not anywhere near one or two. They want to change things up so that people go to them. But do you think Verizon or AT&T is going to do anything in response to this? To be honest, I'm not really excited about this. I mean, $10 a month, so that's 120 bucks a year. So, yeah, you're saving a little bit of money if you want to upgrade, you know, twice per year. Yeah, that's quite a bit of money that you're going to save. But honestly, I stick with the same phone for so long because I don't really want to change to the newest phones ASAP. I always wait for like the second generation of something. So, uh, and, and you would have to move to T-Mobile. I mean, there's service. So how do you feel about that? I'm on T-Mobile <laughs> right now. So that's why I'm oh, like, you I, are? I am with my, with my, my uh, S3. Yeah. And that's why I was really looking forward to the end of the year when they're claiming LTE everywhere, even though my phone can't do that. So eventually I will be able to do that. But this concept of if they're building out their network, this may this is starting to look a little bit more interesting. Verizon's big hook is they have that massive network. at t claims the fastest speeds. But if T-Mobile does have an equal network, which is a big if, this starts looking a little bit more and more appealing to me. I don't know if I want to switch up every six months, but I kind of like the option because I think Verizon and at t move to something like a 24 or 26 month right, yeah. window. That's the next time you can upgrade. You think this is going to get people on board with T-Mobile? Um, I think we have gotten really used to the whole, oh, I'm not allowed to upgrade yet. I'll just sort of deal with it for the next few months. Even if you've got a phone that's maybe a little long in the tooth or, or has gotten kind of beat up, that sort of thing. I can't imagine wanting three phones in a single calendar year. I mean, if you can upgrade as many as uh, as frequently as twice a year, then you would get mm -hmm. three. Right. I, I, right. I just can't imagine doing that. It seems like almost more trouble than it's worth. However, if you're the kind of person who's like, I just really want to try out a phone for a while. You know, maybe I'll try that new Nokia. Let's try out this whole megapixel thing. In six months, I can just get something else that's not a big deal. And I only have to pay $10 on top of whatever I'm paying. I can see this appealing to certain people. But I don't know if this is going to get someone to say, you know, Verizon is really screwing me over. I'm ready for T-Mobile rules. Because again, it all comes down to, for me, coverage. Yep. I just thought of a really good use case for this. Um, my fiance, he's on Verizon and he has a Droid Razor Max. The thing broke. He just like dropped it on carpet and the screen completely shattered. And he had to send it in. He had to pay a hundred dollar deductible to the insurance company. Thank God he had insurance on the thing. But if he had T-Mobile and he had this jump program, he wouldn't have had to deal with that because he would just be able to upgrade in six months. And that's about as long as he's already had this phone for. And then he could get something even better instead of having to get another Droid Razor Max, will, which will possibly also break as well. Yeah, it's kind of a different type of insurance plan in mm -hmm. a certain way, which there is insurance mm -hmm. built into this. Now, I don't know a whole lot about this. I haven't had the time to really read into it. But what, the thing that kind of caught my attention is what do they do with these devices? So it, it sounds very kind of almost irresponsible from a Greens perspective, mm -hmm. right? Like every six months, I'm going to send you this phone. What are you going to do with it? Are they refurbish and selling it to people? Are they throwing it in a landfill? I don't what think they, they haven't mentioned that. But the other thing is, like you mentioned, though, you don't get to keep your phone. So even if you've been paying right. this thing off for like 23 months and you want to exchange it now, you've got to give it back. Mm -hmm. So if you have it for 24 months, I guess you get to, you paid off the whole price of the phone. But I, it seems strange when you uh, actually exercise that option. I would assume they're doing refurbs. 
Uh, yeah. I don't know if they I would. I hope so. Because that would be a PR <laughs> nightmare. It's like, yeah, okay. totally. I mean, it's <laughs> T-Mobile, you're the uncarry. Seems we just a little irresponsible. Out every to couple just... seconds. I don't know if that'll work. Yeah. Well, perhaps they should look into a service like Gazelle, who happens to be our second sponsor no, of this sure. episode of Tech News Today. That worked nicely, didn't it? Uh, Gazelle is actually a great way to feel responsible when you've got all these gadgets sitting around your house. You're like, what am I going to do? I don't want to put them in the trash. That doesn't seem like a good idea. They got batteries inside. Yeah, what you do is you give them to Gazelle, and you know what Gazelle does? Gazelle gives you cash for these gadgets that are just sitting around worth basically nothing to you. Maybe you want the new Samsung Galaxy S4. Maybe you're looking looking for the new HTC One. Maybe that Nokia 41 megapixel phone sounds pretty good. Before you upgrade, make sure you sell your used phone or your gadget to Gazelle for cash. You can find out how much you're going to get at gazelle.com right now. Just go to G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com. And look up your item or your items. Maybe you've got five things. You can get a lot of money. Then you tell Gazelle the condition that your items are in. Brand new, never used, or barely used. Maybe it's got a scratch. Maybe maybe you are actually got a device that's not even working. It's okay. They buy broken iPhones and iPads. And they're also taking back a large selection of tablets. So in addition to something like the iPad, you can now sell Samsung tablets, the Google Nexus, Kindle Fire, Microsoft Surface, Asus tablets. If you're looking at the next greatest thing, make sure you get a little bit of cash for your stuff from Gazelle. Go to gazelle.com right now to get an offer for your Samsung, your iPhone, your HTC, your BlackBerry smartphone. Then get paid fast by check, PayPal, or if you use an Amazon gift card, you'll get an extra 5%. Look at what you can get for that Samsung Note. 200 bucks, 200 bucks. Just for, just, for, just for giving Gazelle the gadget that you're not even using. With Gazelle, you get paid in cash. Payment is fast. Offers are locked in for 30 days, but do it now because we all know that the value depreciates the longer you wait. Go to, Zell, go to gazelle.com, find out what your used gadgets are worth today. And we thank Gazelle for sponsoring this episode of Tech News Today. All right, let's go back to that story about PC shipments dropping in the second quarter. Well, that's what they always do, right? But the interesting thing about this report, this is a Gartner report, that worldwide personal computer shipments uh, totaled 76 million uh, shipments in the second quarter of this year, which is an 11% drop from 85.32 million in the same period a year ago. But it's the fifth quarter in a row of declining shipments and the longest duration of decline in the PC market's history. We had Lenovo in first place uh, with worldwide shipments, had 16.7% share. HP was in second place. Dell was in third. Acer in fourth. In the U.S. market alone, it looks a little bit different. HP is actually number one, 26.4% of all shipments. Dell is in second place. Apple in third place. Apple's share actually dropped year over year to 11.6% from 12. So not a huge drop, but it was a drop. Shipments fell 4.3%. Uh, HP's volume shrank just about a half percent. Dell actually rose 6.4% shipment growth. Again, U.S. market versus global market. But, Shannon, do you, do you think that this is just, a, a, you know, the fifth quarter in a row of declining shipments and there'll be a sixth and there'll be a seventh? Do we do we see this trend reversing ever or is this just the way that it goes? I'm concerned that it's going to continue like this. Although I, I'm a PC user. I've built my own PC since I was a kid. I've never actually physically bought a computer. Mm -hmm. I always buy them and or build the parts myself. But I'm... I've been seeing a big change since I started doing Before You Buy of seeing all-in-one PCs and PCs that can be turned into a tablet. Like uh, there's a Dell on the market right now that comes as an all-in-one PC with a dock and a keyboard and mouse. And then you can pick it up and use it as a very, very large tablet that only lasts like four hours of battery life. So I think if they can continue building machines like that that can you know, be convertible in that sense, then yeah, we might be able to see a reversal of this trend, but will they also be considered PCs? That's the big question. 
Yeah, it's a definition thing, right? It's like they're talking mm-hmm. about laptops and desktops. When everything's turning in, when the desktops themselves are turning into giant tablets, do tablets now become a PC or not? It's just it's just semantics at this point. People are using their phones as their PCs, using tablets as PCs. It's just it's because they have this traditional uh, in, traditional definition of what a PC is. These numbers, I think, will keep dropping. Kind of like PDA numbers kept dropping because all the functions got put into a smartphone, you're not like, oh, no, the PDA is dead. It's like, yeah, it is, but it's really in your phone at this point. If all these functions are growing and growing into tablets, uh, Windows 8 being a good example of this, that's a tablet operating system that has a real operating system underneath. So that has this old legacy stuff that would say that PC sales could go up if Windows does really well. But it's it's just about what this product category is turning into because a personal computer is the device that you're using all the time. So what's the thing you're using? I'm using my, I'm using like what, two tablets and a phone most of the time. Mm-hmm. My laptop only when I need to type something. So I don't, I just, I don't see this ever like reversing because we're just changing behaviors. Yeah, exactly. And Lenovo in first place, does that surprise anybody? Yes. Yeah? <laughs> no. Because I said, Horribly, it surprises me. Oh, because of the idea pads? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because I should, yeah, those pressed, are laptops, so. Yeah, but as a laptop. But they usually, at least the ThinkPad line has the best keyboards. So when you're typing... And keyboards are very important to you because you get stabby when there's a bad keyboard on a Oh laptop. my gosh, I do get stabby. <laughs> More like, I, get, I can't believe, what was that? I can't remember. I, I volunteered to review something for you, Shannon, because it was like the worst laptop keyboard I've oh, yes, ever used. Oh I remember that. <laughs> we won't past- name any names here, but... <laughs> yeah, watch before you buy and you'll see my review of... Oh, it's a Toshiba, I think. Wow, was that a see, piece I'm of- surprised that there's not a lot of growth with PC gamers. I, I mean, I know that there's some really good uh, new... Um, products out there for televisions like you know the ps4 and the xbox one that's coming out but i'm surprised that there's not more gamers purchasing pcs i think the gamer market's saturated that's probably what's keeping these numbers Saturation. the way they are like yeah. that's the, the hardcore gamers the people who want to build their machines are still doing that so that's why it's only an 11 percent drop because yeah. if it was <laughs> if it was if they weren't there it'd be like a 20 percent drop because you want to build your own machines all right, let's talk about Google spending all that money, probably just a drop in the bucket for Google, $500 million on that Moto X to let people know about it. Yeah, the journal's reporting that Google is allowing, will allow Motorola to spend upward of $500 million in marketing for the Moto X. So we don't know what the number is. This is a journal report. Uh, the Moto X is expected to be on all four major U.S. carriers, so that's pretty big sprint, uh, AT&T, T-Mobile, and Verizon. The journal says that... Uh, Moto has successfully minimized carrier bloatware. So they've talked to the carriers, and they have a lot less bloatware than you're expecting uh, from any other smartphone. The price of the Moto X is expected to be on par with the iPhone and the S4, so about 200 bucks with a contract. Uh, IDC says Motorola has about 1% of the global market. Now, I was looking into advertising budgets, and back in April, a Simco had a look at Samsung's advertising expenses. In 2012, Samsung spent $4 billion in advertising. In 2011, $2.5 billion. Now, Apple spent $500 million in 2009, and their budget, budget grew to $1 billion by 2012. Dell spent around $750 million in ads in 2012. So Google theoretically allowing Motorola to, let's say they max it out to $500 million. Is that enough marketing money to make Motorola have, the Moto X have a, a dent in this marketplace? Because compared to Samsung, Samsung's putting out billions and Moto X, they have to get, they only have, uh, Motorola only has 1%. Depends on what their market is. I mean, if if Moto is is targeting the U.S. initially and they're putting $500 million into their U.S. marketing, uh, that's pretty big. Samsung has the worldwide reach. I'm not saying that Moto X is only coming to the U.S., mm-hmm. but it really depends on what their marketing spread is, I would guess. I believe it's worldwide yeah. for the Moto X budget. Is, is it just Which marketing that makes a difference? <laughs> is it a matter if the hardware is any good? Because the, is it just marketing budgets that really make a big difference? Because Samsung is number one, and they're spending a, sp- spending a crap ton of money. I mean, of course it matters that the hardware is, is, is awesome, and if it isn't, then it's a dud. But uh, marketing matters. It, Samsung has I, I, these... This four billion dollar number in 2012 is staggering to me. I was like, four billion dollars? Are you crazy on market or advertising expenses? Or advertising, marketing, of course, inextricably linked. But 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 they've had a lot of success as well. And I mean, a lot of people say things like, you know, the the HTC phone. If you were to compare it to, you know, the Galaxy line, it's really a better phone. But Samsung is absolutely winning uh, because there's brand recognition. There are commercials that people remember. They've gone against Apple quite successfully. So yeah, this stuff does matter. And maybe 500 million is just the beginning of of some sort of Moto X campaign. And yeah, if you're going worldwide, I guess that's the way it goes these days. 
Shannon, do you think that's enough? Five hundred million dollars for the Moto X? I mean, <laughs> like this. So we have Apple ads. We got Samsung ads every three seconds. Yes. So we, do you think it's enough? I hope it is because that's a lot of money. Five hundred million. No, marketing. Marketing is really, really important for these new devices. I mean, even back in the days of Mad Men, <laughs> marketing is very important. I'm going to start buying Heinz beans now. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they need. They need a spiritual connection. I, I'm just afraid that if Motorola botches this, if this turns into the palm free marketing where it's like, why is this creepy person looking at me now? Oh, God. Here's a phone for you. For you. Like, I don't really, and the ads have to be really good. I don't care how much money you spend on these. If these ads suck, they are not going to do, <laughs> they're going to do nothing. Even if the hardware is amazing, there's nothing you can do about this. Because HTC's got some great hardware. They're not making any money. LG's got some great hardware. They're not making any money. So if Motorola's got Google's pockets, maybe they can do something. But I, they, Google wants this company to be profitable. Do we th do we think that uh, enough people out there who would be in the market to buy a smartphone and might be looking at the Moto X care that whatever carrier they choose, all four carriers in the U.S., would have minimal bloatware? I mean, I, I know that we all say, well, that's a good thing. That's definitely moving in the right direction. Who wants bloatware? Nobody. But 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 do the numbers that 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 Motorola would have to get from the general populace. Would those people do? Are those people looking at things like that? Well, when I consider someone like my sister or my mother when they're purchasing a phone, they they definitely aren't so obsessed with tech like we are. But it's important to them that their phone, when they pick it up, it's not confusing. There's not a whole bunch of stuff bloating it out. So yeah, I think it's important that they don't have as much bloatware on there. I bet they don't notice that there's bloatware or not. It's right. this performance difference you'll have mm -hmm. because when, they, when there's something like TouchWiz on there and I put a different ROM on my Android phone and it runs faster because there's less crap on it and running all the time, that's what you'll notice. I think the bigger thing of them being on uh, all four carriers, that advertising campaign goes a lot more instead of saying the Moto X one, two, three on this network and the Moto X, you know, three, four, five over there. They can just say Moto X, it's on everything. Something like Sam Samsung did with the S3. I think that'll be a big, bigger deal than the bloatware thing. Bloatware, you'll just notice in performance mm -hmm. or the lack of, uh, of bloatware. But th this, getting the same name on every carrier could be really big. Yeah. Definitely. It's nice to have consistency across the board and less bootware. Moto X. Uh, we're rooting for you, I guess. 500 million. See what it can do for you. Also, what uh, it might be able to be uh, good for you, especially if you hang out on your browser a lot, going down rabbit holes, looking for something, only to find some obscure blog and wonder, how did I get here and what does it all mean? You might like Lumi, which is a content discovery engine uh, from the founders of Last.fm. And you might have actually heard of Lumi before because they actually started uh, private testing of Lumi back in December to a, to a small group of folks. The idea is Felix Miller and Martin Stixel, who are the founders of Last.fm, which sold to CBS Interactive back in 2007, pretty much at that point took some time off. They said they had houses and... And, and they were gardening and, 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 and starting on sort of normal person projects where you might need to do research on gardening equipment type of a thing. So they were, they were going to the web to look up stuff and thinking, well, hold on a second. I mean, we're so ingrained in the way that we, we use uh, search functionalities and search tools. How about we build something new and different? This might sound familiar to you. This is a content recommendation engine called Lumi. So what you do is, and I tried this out this morning, their, their service is getting hammered right now, but uh, I used the Chrome extension. What you do is you open an account either by email or Twitter, and then you either install a browser add-on or some sort of extension. Chrome, Firefox, and Safari are all supported. It scans your web browsing history and they make a really big point to say it's your history file, not third-party cookies because it's anonymized and they know how privacy is very important to everybody. Then it'll scan your browsing history and, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a combo of what have I looked for in the past uh, coupled with what are other people looking for online it just in the world, puts it all together and tries to serve up interesting things for me based on the kind of person I am, and then maybe really, really interesting, trending sites or a blog post or something online that enough other people are looking at that it might be interesting to me. However, it's web only, at least for now. When I when services come out that are web only, I kind of go like, well, it's, it's, it's like you're only half trying because we see the mobile numbers that so many people like to use these sorts of services everywhere and if there's just one place if you can only do it on your desktop or your laptop uh it's it's pretty limiting 
this to me, guys, I don't know. I mean, it's it's sort of like a stumble upon meets browser you're already using. I just don't know how much the my 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 browsing past is good for my browsing future because I didn't necessarily know back then what I you know, like you I didn't you would, know what you would I browse differently didn't if know. you knew you were being uh, if it was generating results later. Do you think that actually have an impact on you? Because I know, like, I was doing a bunch of research for either know-how projects or, like, just trying to clean my house. Like, engineered hardwood floors. How do you clean them? And there's, like, special rules about this, apparently. It, my history would really help me if something popped up on Lumi saying, oh, by the way, here's something. This is the new definitive thing. Everyone's pointing to this when it comes to ebook scanning or book scanning or other weird projects I'm doing. So I think this might be pretty cool. Not having, a an, like, a mobile component, though, that does seem a little strange, other than the fact that you'd have to build an app that could either read all the other apps which is pretty much impossible. Or you could do uh, a web, like something that ties it to the desktop version, kind of like Chrome where you have a little syncing thing going. Uh, I, I'm kind of curious about this. At first, I, it sounded like about.com to me, like somebody just curating a bunch of crap for you. But then if it's my own history and then putting it up against other people's searches and what they found to be useful, that could be a really interesting way to, actually, it seems like the anti-Google, isn't it? You're not searching. They're just showing you stuff all the time. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, I, it's it's sort of based around the whole, the web is too big. It's too vast. Why are we just blindly searching for things when we could get a much more curated by ourselves and our own behaviors version of the web? Because let's just cut down on stuff that's that's not necessary. Shannon, does this... Do you like this sort of the this sort of approach? Do you feel like the web needs to be categorized for you better? Eh, not really. <laughs> I'm the kind of person that deletes like all my history from all the things all the time. So I don't know if this is going to work out so well for me. I do like the fact that they're doing an add-on idea, an extension for Chrome, Firefox, or Safari, because that'll that'll work out really well for me whenever I'm you know working on my laptop and I move to my PC to do something like multitask on my two dual monitors at home. But otherwise, I don't think I'm going to use this. It just sounds a little bit creepy to me. Even though they say, don't worry, this is all anonymized. It's not about knowing what you, Shannon, do. It's about collectively who's searching for what. Yeah, that's what they say, but I'm going to wait until like one of my favorite privacy articles get a write-up. So then you, you just keep a browser specifically for this, like Firefox. Yeah. I hardly use it. I'll put it on Firefox, and I'll only search for things there that weren't curated, as long <laughs> as it's not going into my other but web see, history. See, there, there's your behavior changing. Well, okay, there we go. It's supposed to be natural, or it's not going to work right. I'll just leave both up, open all the time. Oh, how horrible. I'll open up incognito mode. I'll make sure to use Tor, and then I'll use it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put lots of layers. I'll make sure I only type in codes. and Yeah. It's all funny. Right. I just I think we're all sort of like, yeah, okay, this is interesting, but do we need this sort of thing? We keep seeing these products that are based around the fact that we're all, we've got information overload, and nobody knows where to go anymore. And it's like, let's help you find that thing you didn't realize you needed because you're working on a gardening project. I think you're better at search than I am, or you're searching products, uh, projects that have a lot more information. Because I keep looking up weird stuff, and there's like nothing, or just garbage <laughs> back. Like, this is the best result from Google, and it's garbage. It's always like horrible answers from Yahoo. Why is that the number one answer every freaking time I do a search on Google? It's never any good. Well, maybe once in every 300 searches, okay? So not never. Yahoo, I'm sorry about that. But somebody's got to get this together. There's far too much crap on the web. <laughs> maybe I, I, you just, you're a better uh, search ninja than I am. Well, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'd love to know what you're searching for where there's just nothing. Well, maybe you set, set up a product that takes <laughs> take a look at my web history and you can help me with that. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, before this gets any weirder uh, about Aya's search history, let's move on to the randomizer. And you need hardwood floors. Uh, this is awesome. This is an awesome story. Very smart toddler indeed. Uh, apparently a toddler, a 14-month-old uh, baby, bought a 1962 Austin Healey Sprite on eBay using the eBay, eBay app on, uh, on her father's smartphone. Mm -hmm. And the parent said, eh, we'll keep it. <laughs> <laughs> it costs... Good uh, work. How much does it cost? 225 bucks. Yeah, so it's uh, not actually... Okay. It's not actually... And it looks like a, a real junker. I think it's kind of adorable that they're going to fix it up and then give it to her when she's old enough to drive. Yeah, if it sure still works are. by then. If they're going to put in that much effort. You know, people You're got really mad about in-app purchases, right? They're like, oh, my kid's on the Smurfs game. They're buying all this crap. This one family's like, sure, we'll buy a car. Well, they're in Portland. 
Oh, that's right. <laughs> They're hipsters, is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> Portland's the, the cool kids. They'll pickle it. <laughs> they got to do stuff different. I think this is great. $225, <laughs> and it's like, it was it was fate. It's a great story to tell her when she's older. Jason, I, I'm, I'm sure you've had experience with <laughs> smartphones and tablets. And I have. Things being pressed and you saying, oop, whoops, okay. Yeah, but thankfully I've, I've attached a little security code to <laughs> any pri any purchases that might happen through my device so that never inadvertently happens. I do think it's kind of cool that when she grows up, she can say the very first purchase I ever made online was a car when I was, what, a year old? That's pretty awesome. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it turns out the parents have also, uh, they say they've upped the security on the smartphone. <laughs> yes. New PIN Important number. Important note there. Inst Do that. Installed facial recognition hardware, or software rather. <laughs> I don't think it's hardware. facial recognition hardware just yet. <laughs> New product alert. Just kidding. Uh, so yeah, uh, be, be, uh, be aware when your baby is browsing eBay because they might buy a car. Was it eBay now? Did they get it that day? Delivered by somebody else? <laughs> that would be awesome. No, it looks, I don't know if eBay now uh, works with junkyards. Yeah, no, it looks not like yet. That's where anyways. The, uh, the Austin Healy came from. But, you know, if they do well, that's going to be a really lovely car. All right. Uh, Ayas, is there anything on the calendar? Uh, nope. I'm going to be on vacation until <laughs> Tuesday, if anyone wants to know that. Bye. Ooh, that's important. That's the only thing on the calendar, on yeah. my calendar, anyway. Starting tomorrow, it's actually going to be an interesting show tomorrow because Tom is out till mm -hmm. Monday. You are out tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be with Jason trying to put together a show by my low. Actually, that's not even true. It's not by my low sim because we'll have uh, Darren and Justin Rubber Young here yeah. tomorrow. It'll but be better. Than it'll, it'll be, it'll be unique. Promise. Let's just say that and not shoot ourselves in the foot just yet. It's going to be a <laughs> unique show like no other. Full of best of moments. Mark my words. That is probably something that you can bet on. The whole on. episode, just mark that one. Uh, let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. We got an email from Damien who says, not the omen. Good to know, Damien. Uh, he says, he's from Phoenix. He says, in episode 297, 297? That's a long time ago. This no, I think he meant 792. 792. I was gonna, I'm like, that's like two years ago. You were discussing Dropbox's pronouncement that thinking in files and folders is over and how apps can talk to each other across any platform if they store unique data in a user's Dropbox account. He says, I see a big privacy and security problem with this. Setting aside the issues with filling up your finite size Dropbox with constantly updated garbage from every app and widget we use, setting aside the fact that most apps... Uh, that have a sign-in already do this cross-platform mambo on their servers quite nicely. My problem with this no more files and folders thinking is that we users lose all control of what personal data our apps have access to. For instance, when I enter my personal info in an app that saves to my Dropbox, it's a no not nonsense named data file. That data is likely to exist there as long as my Dropbox account exists, even if I later change or delete that data within the app or stop using it. I'll probably have no ability to find and delete that file within Dropbox, and then other apps will have access to that information. <laughs> Sorry, Damien inspired me to play the theme song for The Omen. There you go. It's, it's been a while. Yeah, Dropbox. There we go. So you're saying Dropbox is evil? I, well, I guess... I think he's saying, listen, I mean, it's, you know, Dropbox still wants people to be paying customers. If you've got finite storage with your Dropbox account and you're using Dropbox more than ever, this works out well for Dropbox, really. Wow, that's crazy. They have a business plan? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. That's nuts. I want free stuff. Free Dropbox stuff. Sucks. I want to control over everything at the same time. And I don't want anyone snooping on me for free well, all the time. I, yeah, that's going to happen. Although I think the, the story about uh, Dropbox new services is not so much everything being stored in Dropbox. It's using Dropbox as a go-between to be able to share information between apps. So it's not just sort of like the single repository that's just going to be full of these weirdly named files, or at least that's that's not how Dropbox is presenting it. So I don't know, Damien. Hopefully. <laughs> when, there's, when there's an evil lurking, Sarah starts laughing. That's, that's one of the weirder things. <laughs> Funniest movie. That little kid was so evil. <laughs> All right, let's get out of this show. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching and listening this episode of TNT. And thanks to Shannon Morse.
Thank AKA you. AKA Snubs for being part of our show, sitting sitting in Tom's old chair. It's nice to have everybody around the table. It's a lot Every easier. so it often. Is. The it's lag, though, is terrible, though. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know. Get on Skype. Shut up. Make it normal again. Uh, tell people, besides before you buy, what you're up to these days and where they can find your work online. Uh, before you buy, most recently I've been working on a printer bot. I built one and I've been trying to calibrate it so that I can print out my cool little 3D things on Hack 5. And you can find that over at hak5.org. Also, Darren Kitchen has been running around with Hack Across America. He's actually taken a van and he's living out of it and going to all sorts of hacker spaces. Is it down by the river? Down by the river. I hope so. Yeehaw. Well, thanks, Shannon. Um, awesome. Please come back soon. And thanks to all of you who submitted and voted stories up and down in our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com is where you can go if you want us to talk about particular stories. We look in, in our subreddit every single morning when we're putting together the show. So thanks for that. In the meantime, you can call us at 260-TNT-SHOW or leave us an email at tnt at twit.tv with comments, suggestions, feedback, all that good stuff. As I mentioned, tomorrow, it's Justin Robert Young and Darren Kitchen joining me for a weirdo, wacky TNT Friday. We'll see you then. <laughs> I was duplicating the dog. Like today was quite a wacky, weirdo show. Sarah's <laughs> favorite dude.